We're going to turn now our attention to the study of gases and focus especially on the gas laws and models of gases both ideal and real. So we're going to begin by looking at gases and the variable of pressure which is unique to gases. So gases are the simplest phase of matter. They consist of particles at large distances relative to the size of the particles in constant random motion. So a gas in a box is just a bunch of tiny, approximately spherical particles just bouncing around randomly. It's our typical image of a gas. Gases are compressible. Because the particles are at such large distances, we can compress a gas down to a smaller volume. That's going to move the particles closer to one another, but this is possible because there are large distances between the particles. Gases immediately fill the space available to them. Each particle has enough kinetic energy that it's going to continue moving until it collides with the wall. And so gases spontaneously expand within their containers. One thing that was noticed early on in the study of gases is that the properties of many gases obey certain relations, certain equations that actually don't depend on the microscopic structure of the gas, which from a chemical perspective is pretty remarkable, right? The notion that a gas like CH4 with one carbon atom and four hydrogen atoms could behave something like H2O, which has an oxygen and two hydrogen atoms, is pretty remarkable, right? The idea that these two could behave similarly to one another is pretty remarkable given their molecular structures. How is this possible? Well, we'll see shortly, and it has something to do with the fact that the particles are at large distances and don't experience forces between them. But before getting there, I want to talk a little bit about pressure which is a property of gases that is, in fact, unique to the gas phase. Because the particles in a gas are in constant random motion, at regular intervals they collide with the walls of their containers. These collisions result in the exertion of a force on the walls of the container. And that's what you see represented here as the variable F. Now, the force caused by gases colliding with the walls of the container depends on the area of those walls. A container that has a much larger area is going to experience a larger force because it's going to have a larger number of gas particles colliding with it at a given period of time. To normalize the force so that it doesn't depend on the cross-sectional area, we can simply divide the force by the area to get a measure of what's called pressure. So pressure is equal to the force exerted by the gas molecules divided by the cross-sectional area over which the force is exerted. We can actually express and think about pressure in a different way other than just force divided by area. And the slide shows you the idea here. We can think of pressure as the height of a column of fluid in a gravity field. So pressure is defined as force divided by area. But the force exerted by a column of fluid with a particular mass is equal to the mass times acceleration due to gravity. And if we plug that into the pressure formula, we get the pressure is equal to mg divided by a. But now the mass we can imagine as the product of the density rho and the volume, right? And so we can write this as the pressure is equal to rho, the density, times the volume, times the acceleration due to gravity, divided by the cross-sectional area. And here the cross-sectional area is the tiny area at the bottom of the column that the fluid is exerting pressure on. If the column is cylindrical, the ratio of the volume to the area, well, the area is simply a circle. And the ratio of the volume to the area is just the height. So in fact, we can write this ratio, rho vg divided by a, as simply rho times the acceleration due to gravity times the height. Now, rho and g are simply constants, constants depending on the identity of the particular fluid that we're looking at. And so we can actually use as a measure of pressure the height of a column of a particular fluid. Examples are shown for you here. Millimeters of mercury and inches of water are two very common examples. Other units of pressure include the SI unit of pressure, which is the Pascal. The SI unit of force is the Newton, kilogram meter per second squared and we divide that by meter squared to get the Pascal, or the Newton per meter squared. The atmosphere is a very common and intuitive unit 
which is equal to about 100,000 pascals, but often we use the atmosphere because the numbers kind of make sense to the human mind, right? One atmosphere is the pressure we all walk around in daily. One bar is on the order of an atmosphere, but is equal to 100,000 pascals, and 760 millimeters of mercury, we just talked about, is equal to one atmosphere. Now that we've talked about pressure in great detail, I want to discuss some of the variables that are relevant to gases and their particular quirks when we start talking about gases. So pressure, we've already talked about in great detail. For a gas, the volume of a gas is equal to the volume of its container. So a gas contained in a cube, for example, is just going to have a volume of the side length cubed. We don't have to worry about where the particles are necessarily. We can assume that the particles are spread uniformly throughout the volume of the container so that the container's volume is equal to the volume of the gas. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of gas particles. We'll see this in much more detail when we talk about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, but for now, you can imagine that higher temperature gas, gases simply have molecules moving at faster speeds, while lower temperature gases have molecules moving at slower speeds. The amount in is pretty self-explanatory. It's the number of gas particles within the gas in moles, and it's the relations between these four variables, pressure, volume, temperature, and amount, that really show us how gas behavior is remarkably uniform, even across different types of gases. So in the next video, we're going to turn our attention to empirical observations of gases and learn how these can be synthesized to generate the ideal gas law.